Welcome back to Black Ops. I'm Emma Gatti and I'm picking up the host chair from the great Ralf Tiller. Black Op is the special web series by Space Watch Global focused on security and defense in space. It's the right place to be if you want to engage in in-depth analysis and discussions about the well-known link between space assets and military operations. It's probably the closest you will ever get to a proper James Bond plot. It's Wednesday afternoon, it's 4 p.m. in Central Europe, and it's time for another episode of our Space Cafe Black Ops by Dr. Magatti. As always, we really appreciate your participation and ongoing feedback as we will learn and improve based on that. I'm Thorsten Kreening, publisher of Spacewatch.global, and we are a Europe-based online platform for information in and about space and new space activities in a geopolitical context context i would like to ask no not last to ask i would like to thank all of our private and corporate supporters that showed their commitment to keep our independent journalism alive and we really appreciate that in case you want to join our supporter team be aware that it's just a click away for you from our website and i know many of you are familiar with our website the bi-weekly and daily newsletters and the space space cafe podcasts and radios the latest podcast features Dr. Nicole Colon, um, NASA astrophysicist and expert in ex exoplanet exploration, a very thought-provoking episode on the future of space exploration. We also have new episodes in our Space Cafe radios. This morning, we published an episode with Raul Verdu from PLD Space about their attempt for maiden flight uh, if you have heard it this morning but we also have christina nicholas of okapi orbits and from the space symposium we have episodes with andre andrew fayola commercial director of astroscale and dr thomas sin of dcube you can find our audio series wherever you can get your podcast and if you want to become a space watcher and let the world know about that with your cool t-shirt or Mac or whatever giveaways we have, visit our fan shop. It's always open because it's on our website. If you have missed any of our previous web talks, we have an archive available on our webpage in the event section and, of course, on YouTube. And with that, for the time being, my job is done. I will monitor your questions and select the cool one then for our dream team. And with that, I'm handing over to Milan. Thank you, Torsten. Thank you, Berlin. Uh, Milan is calling. Thank you guys for being back to the first episode of our uh, Black Ops mini series, uh, fully dedicated to the Indo Pacific and global geopolitical space pictures. You already know her. Our superstar of the series is Dr. Namrata Goswami. Uh, she's an independent scholar on space policy and great power politics. Dr. Goswami is a faculty associate at the Thunderbolt School of Global management at Arizona State University, but she's also a consultant for Space Fund Intelligence and a guest lecturer at the seminar on India Today, Economics, Politics, Innovation and Sustainability. And let's not forget, she's also the author of one of the most important and compelling book about space geopolitics. The title is Scramble for the Skies, the Great Power Competition to Control the Resources of Outer Space. In the fourth episode, uh, well, first of all, let's, Namrata, thank you very much for being here with us. Sorry, I was just diving into the strait of Russia and Japan. <laughs> How are you doing? I'm doing well, and uh, good morning from Montgomery, Alabama. So it's a delight, it's a pleasure and a delight to be back again with you, Emma. Thank you very much, Amrata. So I was just launching in, just I got dragged from the excitement. Today is the fourth episode, and it's a very important episode because it's uh, Russia and Japan. We you entitled the session "Capable Partners in Different Space Orders." So we're gonna delve in both cases. And you know, on one side we have Russia, which is um, a long-standing rival to the United States in the race for space supremacy. 
And on the other side, we encounter Japan, which is a sort of rising star that has been making waves in the space industry since the early 2000s by venturing to space economy, private investments. And of course, we have a lot of geopolitical recent news that can contextualize as well our chat. We have the Ukraine attack uh, last year, but we also had the uh, almost successful mission of iSpace, Akuto, our mission, uh, Luna Lander, which just happened a few weeks ago. And unfortunately, they were not able to establish communication, but they were able to land. So at least uh, they kind of scored uh, a, a point. So these are the backdrop for discussing these two countries and the space culture and the space uh, initiative. And um, of course, Russia and Japan remain very important player, players in the global space arena but they have charted contrasting paths or different paths in the space environment. So of course, uh, what we want to hear from you, Namrata, today is if you can help us to trace, uh, to define the political um, decisions, the space strategies, and of course, helping us to contextualize where they are going, where you predict they will go in the future. So let's start from the easiest question, the most generic one. Could you explain us the main drivers of Russia and Japan space programs, how they differ? Over to you. Yes, absolutely, Emma. And I agree with you that at the time we are speaking, this particular topic is absolutely strategic and critical. One, because Russia as a major power and a major space power is engaged in a military operation in its neighboring state of Ukraine. And then the other important contemporary event for Japan is that North Korea just announced that they're going to launch a satellite into space. The window is May 31st to June 11th. And Japan has actually responded by saying that they have activated their self-defense forces in case the debris from the satellite or the missile that will be launched to uh, utilize this particular satellite capability might fall in Japan. So there is tension in the Japanese uh, you know, environment and strategic environment. And so I think this particular conversation becomes even more relevant. Now to answer your question in terms of drivers for Russia space program and Japan space program and how they differ, so uh, when I uh, look at the Russian space program and look at it historically as a continuation of the Soviet Union space program, and then what they have done since the 1990s after the fall of the Soviet Union till today, Russia has about four critical drivers for their space program. One, uh, interestingly and very strategically, one of the biggest uh, you know, concerns for Russia uh, as a successor state to the Soviet Union is this importance of deterrence. So from a space security perspective, that means that you can use your space capability to deter another country from either threatening your existence or from threatening your space systems. And then connected to that, the second driver is their fear of uh, missile defense. So if you remember, uh, when Gorbachev was in power just before the Soviet Union collapsed, one of the biggest concerns of uh, the Soviet Union at the time was the Star Wars or Strategic Defense Initiative that uh, President Reagan had yeah. uh, announced. And so that missile defense fear, the concern that United States with a global strike uh, rationale might have space-based weapons that might be used to target Russia is the second driver and concern. So the third driver, based on those very tactical uh, uh, thinking, is national security. So for Russia, the most important uh, priority for their space program is to utilize space for national security capability, by which I mean command and control, nuclear uh, command and control, missile tracking, ballistic missile trajectories to warn them for early warning. And then finally, to use space for counter-strike capability in case they see a threat to their space systems. And then the final driver is, of course, civilian space programs. So Russia is still a pretty advanced nation with an independent launch capability. Uh, they plan to launch the Luna 5 uh, sometime this year in August which is a continuation of their Luna uh, programs that closed in 1976. 
And the idea is that in collaboration with China, they will send a lander to the lunar south pole, equipped with a robotic arm and a drilling instrument to uh, look at the resources that are there on the lunar south pole. Now, in comparison, Japan is different. So if you look at Japan's space program, uh, since 1969 with the uh, constitutional obligation and Article 9, Japan's space program has not been focused on the issues that the Soviet Union and then Russia adopted, which is uh, missile defense, deterrence. It was more about utilization of space for peaceful purposes, and in fact, using space for uh, deterrence, for defense, for any kind of support of offensive operations was frowned upon in the Japanese context. But that started shifting, uh, say, around 1980s, and then finally in 2007, when China tested an anti-satellite weapon. So today, Japan's space program has three critical drivers. One is that it wants to utilize its commercial space capability to advance its uh, not just uh, economic development of space, but also national security as a response to the environment that Japan exists. The second important driver for Japan's space program is to use it as a part of strategic diplomacy. So they want to collaborate with United States, for example, to get back to the moon. They have signed a bilateral agreement with India for lunar development capability. And then the final driver for Japan space program is to invest in space technologies like space-based solar power, where they're actually one of the only countries that have demonstrated microwave beaming for a very short distance, but they have done it. And second, to send missions to asteroids to study asteroid composition being the first country to land on an asteroid successfully. So those are the key differences in terms of Japan and Russia. Very interesting. I took some notes and um, I feel that we're almost ready to trace some comparison also with the countries we organized before. Correct me if I didn't understand, but it seems then uh, Russia's um, main driver space program is uh, closer to a Chinese space program, why the Japanese one is closer to a European one. Am I generalizing too much? Am I saying something stupid? It might, it might well be. Well, I think, uh, well, in some sense, yes. I mean, there is similarity because China also focuses on national security and military development of capability. But unlike Russia, China actually prioritizes the development of its civilian space program wow. and have identified long term goals like asteroid mining, space based solar power, establishing presence, for example, on the lunar uh, surface in collaboration with Russia. So for Russia, where, whereas for China, and this is how China and Russia differs. So for China, the first key driver is economic development. So in, in China's conceptualization, the most important power a nation requires is economic capability and space, both low earth orbit constellations like communication, navigation, presence in cislunar space, for example, on the lunar surface, deep space probes like asteroid probes and Mars will help in terms of economic development. And once you have economic capability, you can utilize it for national security purposes. For Russia, the focus is national security first. And uh, in fact, Russia does not articulate, as, of, as I've seen in their strategic documents, whether they think investment in space is going to contribute to Russia's economic development. They seem to see it much for, more from a national security perspective. So there is there are differences in terms of China and Russia's uh, space program. Thank you very much, Namrata. Speaking about strategy, uh, can you maybe give us a bit more, uh, uh, stra maybe, more, more consideration about the strategic uh, plans for Russia and Japan space program? Yes, absolutely. So uh, Russia uh, instituted a new uh, military doctrine in 2014, a revision of the 2010 doctrine. And in that particular doctrine, what was important and critical for Russia is to utilize its space forces for uh, nuclear command and control, and most importantly, as a force multiplier for any kind of existential threat to the Russian regime. So space was seen as a very critical enabler of Russia's early warning, 
uh, Russia's, uh, you know, reconnaissance, intelligence, surveillance of force deployment in the neighborhood, for example, the presence of NATO capability close to its strategic neighborhood. And then finally, what was fascinating in that particular strategy uh, that they adopted in the military doctrine, which is continuous today, is that they argued that they will use nuclear weapons supported by space structures as a first strike in case they see a conventional threat to their existence, which is different from some other nuclear weapon states like India that has a no first use policy and China too has a no first use policy vis-a-vis -a, -vis a conventional attack. And then what they did in terms of their strategic reconfiguration is that uh, in 2015, Russia restructured its armed forces and established the space forces within the Department of Air and Space Force. And so the task given to the Space Force was to be responsible for space situational awareness, as I mentioned, early warning of ballistic missile attack, uh, satellite launches and operations. And more importantly, what was so critical in terms of strategy is that they saw their space forces as a deterrence capability, so not offensive. So the argument is that Russia would respond to an attack on their space systems, especially their uh, GLONASS system, for example, their navigation system, which is critical for Russia's military communication, navigation, and force deployment. And so that's the strategy for uh, Russia. So in some sense, they are offensive in terms of their uh, military operations in Ukraine, crossing another country's sovereign border. But when it comes to the operational ethos, it's more defensive. So they view in their own strategic mind that their space support is mostly defensive. So in that context, when I saw them test their anti-satellite weapon, uh, in November of uh, 2021, just before the invasion of Ukraine, most people thought that this particular anti-satellite test by Russia, where they targeted their own satellite, is about deterring other nations from coming to the aid of Ukraine. I think such analysis forget that one of the biggest strategic trauma of Russia is missile defense and the capability of countries like US too, without them knowing, use space-based uh, weapons, especially conventional capability, to target their space structure. So their anti-weapon test was a strategic move to showcase to the U.S. that in case the U.S. thinks of attacking or destroying Russian space support structure, they have the capability to do so. I think they took it for strategic uh, guarantee that the United States will support Ukraine. They wanted to make sure that the U.S. does not engage in uh, targeting their space system. So the anti-satellite weapon was a signaling. Now coming to Japan, and I'll end there. So if you look at Japan's strategic guidance, the national security strategy that they published in 2022, it reflects the change in Japanese strategic thinking when it comes to space. So as I pointed out, 1969, they had a uh, in the Japanese diet, which is the parliament, they had a guidance that Japan will use space only for peaceful purposes. That changed with the 2008 basic space law, which was under the Shinzo Abe uh, government. So in that particular space law, Japan argued that for Japan, given the context of the rise of China, disputed borders, North Korea, the fact that North Korea was testing missile capability and launching to space, uh, traversing Japanese uh, sovereign airspace. It is really critical for Japan to have a defensive space structure and to develop space capability for dual use purpose. So this was a great change in strategic thinking for Japan. Fast forward to 2022, uh, Japan today has three important components of their national security space. One is that they have a national security strategy that talks about multi-domain operations for defensive purposes. And in fact, with offensive capability. So they argue that if they feel threatened in terms of their existence, say by an adversary, they're going to use space to counter that, including counter-strike capability, which is an extremely new development for Japan. The second important change in terms of strategy is the constitution of a space force. So in 2020, Japan established the Space Operations Squadron called the Japan Space 
a domain mission unit under the Japanese Self-Defense Air Forces. And that particular space uh, operations squadron, which has about, uh, at that time when it was established, about 30 members, scaling it up to about 100 to 150 members in the next few years, will be the main body for Japan to ensure that they have national security capability. And then finally, in terms of Japan's national security strategy, they are going to develop an independent uh, navigation system, which they already have, the quasi Zenit system, as you know, but they want to scale it up so that in case conflict happens in the East, uh, East Asian atmosphere, including an attack, for example, an invasion uh, of Taiwan by China, Japan should have uh, independent navigation capability and should not be dependent on the global positioning system maintained by the Space Force. So that's Japanese uh, space strategy for you. Emma, you're muted. Sorry, I've been speaking for one minute by myself. Apologize. Yeah, we enjoyed the silence. <laughs> thank you. I was saying that thank you for mentioning the ASAT weapon test in 2021, Ramrata, because uh, um, that was very interesting moment just before the Ukraine. Already the tensions were raising up because I think the Russian soldiers were already uh, gathering around the borders. And But then when the test happened, we asked um, a couple of experts uh, and they all say the same. They knew that there was a message to the U.S., uh, but it was no, it was not clear yet message for what message uh, for which reasons and then the Ukraine um, war exploded and suddenly we were like okay maybe they're testing a something a sort of like instrument but as you said you stick a thing to the showcasing uh, opinion correct. Uh, we can't hear you, Emma. You still cannot hear me? Yeah, no, oh, now okay. we can. Okay, good, good, good. Uh, did you hear my question? Uh, no, I, I, I didn't. Uh, so uh, could you please repeat the last part of the question? Of course, of course. Uh, no, it was just an observation. Like yeah, uh, yeah. Um, you, you told us uh, about, you think that the as that weapon, the, 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 as that testing in 2021 was a sort of signal, a message that Russia wanted to send to, to the US. And um, in the aftermath of the Ukraine war, there were some doubts about whether this was a test, that it was actually a technical uh, exercise that Russia was uh, running. But as you said, it was probably more of a showcasing and a message sent uh, to the US in terms of like, we are ready to do something if you're gonna move in the wrong direction, correct? Yes, so I think I think it was more to showcase uh, deterrence by punishment capability. Uh, so when you yes. think about, uh, when you look at their military doctrine, one thing that came out in the doctrine was that Russia recognized that the international strategic situation was changing in the favor of major uh, emerging countries. So, uh, and they made it clear. So I think uh, by then, you, if you remember, they had already invaded the Crimea and taken it over, right? Yeah. And so they were using space systems for their military uh, force deployment, communication, precision munitions that they had adopted as part of their military force structure. And so what was fascinating was that when they did that anti-satellite weapon test, I think the misunderstanding in the West was that this was about deterring any kind of Western support to Ukraine. But I think when I look at their strategic culture, and that is where strategic culture really matters. So in the Russian strategic culture, and sometimes I, I feel because we are uh, upset by what Russia is doing in Ukraine, we forget that there is a strategic culture there too that within Russia, they support this kind of operation, right? It's just not Putin's imagination. Medvedev supports it. If you look at the latest poll, there is support for what Russia is doing despite the hardships, right? So the one of the strategic trauma for Russia historically, as I mentioned, as a successor nation to the Soviet Union is space-based missile defense, by which I mean the capability of to in, in, in to, uh, intervene in another country's space capability from space 
uh, the ability to strike from space with conventional capability. And so when they carried out their anti-satellite weapon tests, the reality was that the United States military's posture is still called global strike, right? Mm -hmm. So global strike, uh, US Strategic Command, they have capability to strike globally with the help of their space-based structures. So Russia's strategic thinking is that if we can showcase an anti-satellite weapon, we can actually deter any kind of attack on our space systems because by the United States, because we have the capability to do the same to them. Yes. Yeah. And so, so it was a very specific tactical signaling on the part of Russia. And of course, uh, the U.S. has way more dependence on signals from this from space than Russia in the sense. So it's like uh, uh, is kind of an amplified uh, deterrence in a sort of way. Yes, and also if you if you think about it, the U.S. commercial space sector is playing a key role in the Ukraine conflict, yeah, right? Sense. Starlink and Maxar, and Russia has engaged in electronic warfare, cyber jamming, spoofing, yeah. but space SpaceX is countering that. But then many questions people ask the question: Why have they not destroyed, for example, with their anti-satellite weapon capability, right? Which they have. But I think that would work to Russia's uh, this. Uh, it will also uh, degrade Russian space capability, right? So if you attack and destroy a huge constellation of satellites, it's a dangerous you're also... game. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. Because then you're also making the same space unavailable for Russia. Then they'll have to depend on humans and ground-based uh, communications, which they do not have uh, to the level they have in space. So. Thank you. So going back to your observation about strategic consideration, Russia and Japan, um, moving on to space capabilities and space capacities, which is what can turn the strategy into reality. Mm -hmm. uh, Japan is very distant from Europe, so it's kind of difficult from here to actually assess their space capacities. And on Russia, it's almost a kind of clouds of gossip. They are decaying. They don't have any space capacities. Yes, they have. They're still a very strong power. No, they are not. They cannot uh, build anything new. They're living on what they created in the 60s. Uh, what's, uh, what, what's your view? How advanced is Russia and Japan's space capacities to actually turn the strategy into a, a, a reality? Yes, that's a great question because space capacity really matters. So when I think about Japan's space capacity, one, they are, as I said, planning to develop their own uh, GPS kind of navigation structure, right? That will help their own communications. They already have that support structure, but the hope is that they want to scale it up and develop it to the level that it uh, covers Japan and Australia, but also covers their sea uh, operations in case there is an escalation of conflict uh, in the East China Sea that they dispute. So, and then Japan also has their own uh, independent launch capability, the H-2 rocket series. Uh, they're able to send about, uh, I think, 10 ton to low Earth orbit. Japan is hoping to develop a medium lift rocket with the H3 rocket that failed actually. They launched it in March of this year and uh, it the second stage did not ignite, but they're hoping to test it again. So uh, they do have the capability to launch to space, which is a very important capability. And as you uh, know, South Korea just, re uh, and South Korea is an ally when it comes to that particular area. They also launched their own independent commercial satellite with their own indigenous space craft this year. So there is, uh, and then finally, Japan has an advanced uh, commercial industry. So uh, not just in terms of uh, supporting, in, uh, so Mitsubishi is very much involved in their navigation system, but they also have companies, as you said, Astroscale, which is thinking of developing uh, space debris removal capability, which can also be used for dual purposes, right? It can be used to, uh, in the scenario that I work on, you can use the robotic arm or whatever uh, cleaning technology you have to remove satellites as well. So that capability Japan is developing. And then finally, Japan is investing a lot, unlike Russia, where Japan is moving ahead. So uh, Japan is developing their commercial, not just uh, low earth or geosynchronous, but 
Earth Moon capability. So Japan has a very advanced lunar program. Uh, JAXA supports it, but they also have iSpace, as you mentioned in your opening remarks, that successfully entered lunar orbit uh, this year and attempted to land soft land on the lunar surface, but they hard landed. So uh, like the Indian uh, landing, which was a hard landing, and so they lost communication due to a software glitch. So that capability is pretty advanced, and they're planning to uh, basically uh, attempt a launch again next year. Now, Japan is one of the only countries that have gone to an asteroid successfully and landed and brought back resources, you know. And so that is a pretty advanced capability for a country with uh, space development. So those are Japan's capability and they can use it for national security purposes as well. And as I mentioned, space civilian capability remains civilian to the point that a country would not want to use it for national security. But in 2022, Japan shifted and said that space capability will be utilized for national security purposes as part of multi-domain operation. So there is that strategic shift. Russian space capability. So, of course, uh, you're, you're, you're right. There is a lot of con conversation about the decaying of Russia's space capability. Uh, to an extent, I would say that one of the most important data I look at when I look at a country's space capability is that what have they achieved once they announce particular goals, right? So for Russia, it still has its own independent launch capability with the several rockets that they have, including human uh, human and cargo uh, spacecrafts. It has, that is on the civilian side. Uh, Russia also has national security space capability. For example, in 2019, as you know, Russia deployed their inspector satellite that they launched, uh, which came very close to a US uh, military satellite. And uh, what was fascinating was that this particular inspector satellite program has been developed since 2013. The idea is that they want to use it for three purposes, and that's a big capability. One is that they want to use it for rendezvous and proximity operation, that you come very close to a satellite, either of your own, you inspect it for what the satellite's purpose is, uh, whether you can uh, use it for a projectile, an anti-satellite weapon that can target a satellite, or you just hover around to see what kind of data that particular satellite is collecting. And Russia has that capability. In fact, for the first time in 2019, uh, Russia uh, also released a second satellite from their one satellite launch. So those are the capabilities Russia has. Now, where are they in terms of their civilian space capability? I think that's where Russia is falling behind. So uh, if you look at their uh, the development of the Soyuz 5, which is a medium lift rocket capable of taking about 24 tons to low Earth orbit, they have not tested it yet. The date they had set earlier was 2022. I think the Russian invasion of Ukraine, the sanctions have created uh, problems for Russia. And so the date has been sent back. As you know, uh, Emma, they have recently had a legal dispute with Kazakhstan over the uh, over the spaceport, Baikonur, where Kazakhstan sees the assets of the company that Senki, that is in charge of the spaceport, because they had not paid their dues, about a hundred million dollars a year that Russia pays. They forgot so, to pay the rent. <laughs> yes, and so Russia, and you can see Kazakhstan because of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, actually is now challenging. Russia to pay up, either pay up or lose uh, access to that particular yeah. port. Right? And so, and then finally, in the lunar program, Russia is also very much behind. So, Luna 25 was supposed to launch in 2020. They have pushed it back recently. Uh, uh, the Roscosmos had, uh, he gave a talk in which he pointed out that they will have to probably push it back even further. So unlike China, where it meets its space goals on time once they announce it, including their lunar missions, the Shenzhou 16 that they just launched on Monday, Russia seems to be incapable of meeting their uh, civilian launch goals as well as their lunar, lunar goals. So we'll have to wait and see whether they are successful in that. And just sticking for a second to the civilian um, sector, the ISS is gonna. Uh, this, the ISS adventure is gonna end soon in 2030. Like, do you think Russia is gonna move on to ch with China 
to carry on somehow the civil project, the civil program or, or not? Because they declared that they were interested, but I don't know, what's your position on this? Well, I think my position on this is based on what they are saying, right? So yes, they want to uh, end their space cooperation with the International Space Station. In fact, uh, ISS is only funded till about 2030. So Russia wants to exit by 2028. The Russians actually maintain quite a lot of uh, technologies with the ISS, yeah. including the propulsion system, right? So uh, they are now saying that they haven't, it's very fascinating because if you look at their uh, partnership, for example, uh, strategic partnerships, they have signed agreements with China when it comes to lunar exploration, uh, planetary defense and asteroid exploration. They have not yet signed an agreement to collaborate with the Tiangong space station. Uh, instead, what they're saying is that they are going to reinvest in developing their own uh, space station, right? Mm -hmm. And so by 2030. Now, whether, as I said, now the trajectory of Russia's announcements of civilian space program is that while they announce very ambitious programs, because Emma, and this is where I think their national security focus comes in, but because their strategic culture is to focus on the national security aspects of their space program, they prioritize that because that's the requirement right mm -hmm. today and for the next five years, given the Ukraine conflict and Russia's existential fear that it might uh, you know, the Putin regime or the uh, regime that runs Russia will be threatened. So because of that, I am I am I'm not as uh, confident that they would actually successfully launch their own space station by 2030. That's my position, but I might be proven wrong, you know, and so uh, they have announced it. They have said that they want to have their own space station. They're developing. In fact, there are two technologies they're also developing in collaboration with that. One is a nuclear tuck capability, which is a very critical technology. And the second technology is also uh, they have just announced is then a, a much more advanced propulsion system development for their own space station. So let's see. We will use this video to push your career against you in a few years' time. <laughs> yes, if I if I if they, if they succeed, then I can I will always you know once you know this is I'm glad you said that because every time I get data that challenges me. I have to include that in my analysis, right? Of because course. when I first started studying China space program, I was also a little skeptical whether they will achieve the goals that they had announced, right? But once they started achieving their goals, I had to factor that in into my analysis and, and change my own strategic uh, rationale and thinking. So yeah, thank you for <laughs> making sure you have this video with you. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> you mentioned um, the Ukraine, that we, we already, of course, already mentioned the Ukraine conflict, yeah. but I was wondering if you think that the invasion of Ukraine has somehow affected Russia's space capacities. You already touched upon briefly before, but I would like to pick this one up again. Oh, yes, it has. So uh, one of the biggest uh, resource uh, generation for Russia was its Soyuz capability, right, for commercial launches. As we know, they had launched one web satellites. They were one of the workhorses for uh, the International Space Station. In fact, the U.S. did not have an independent capacity till about uh, June 2020, uh, when uh, SpaceX Dragon capsule launched from uh, Florida to the International Space Station. So, Fast forward to 2022, given the sanctions, uh, given the fact that several companies are now looking for alternate sources of, uh, you know, basically launching. OneWeb, for example, had launched 36 of their satellites on Soyuz just before the conflict. But during the conflict, because uh, the United Kingdom had 42% share in OneWeb, uh, Russia had insisted that one web satellite constellations cannot be used to monitor Ukraine. Mm -hmm. That was a condition. And uh, of course, that fell out, and then the satellites were not launched, and then one web went to India, right? So, in fact, the biggest impact of the Ukraine conflict is the Soyuz losing out in the commercial market, right? And that's one of the biggest uh, sources of Russia's ability to continue developing their space program, including their national security capability. They already have pretty advanced 
uh, support in terms of communication navigation. But I think the Ukraine conflict is having an impact on their uh, resource capability uh, in terms of their space program because of sanctions. Uh, true, very true, absolutely. Um... So moving to Japan, I know that Japan released a national security strategy in 2022. Uh, how is space factor into this into this strategy? Yeah, so in the national security strategy, Japan pointed out a very critical strategic shift in their thinking. And so space factors in as a multi-domain capability, like joint operations, right, which the United States has as a support function. So, uh, so importantly, uh, in their national security strategy, Japan pointed out that Japan has to enable their uh, technologies, including space technology, to ensure that Japan can defend their homeland against external aggression. And for that purpose, while the uh, overall national security rationale was defense, the operations were pretty offensive. So in the national security document, it was pointed out that Japan is now going to build space situational awareness capability, a task of the space squadron that will not just monitor satellites, especially anti-satellite capability like jamming, spoofing, not just kinetic ASAT, but they'll also develop capability to monitor hypersonic glide vehicles, right? Very, very critical because Japan, uh, China, I beg your pardon, had just uh, tested a hypersonic glide vehicle that traversed low Earth orbit in July of 2021. And, and so Japan wanted to build a radar system based on satellite support and ground support that can actually see where that hypersonic glide vehicle was going, especially because it comes from the South Pole. Sometimes U.S. radar systems are not looking at it. Right. Mm -hmm. So and so finally, in terms of space, to answer your question directly, so that's the larger focus. So space now forms a very integral part of Japan's national security strategy, not just in terms of intelligence, surveillance and reconnaissance, but also to use space capability for counter strike in case an adversary space system is being used in helping that particular adversary's forces to invade Japan or take over disputed islands in the, in the disputed territories, right? So uh, space is now one domain that is connected to all the other domains, and it is seen as an absolute vital component of their multi-domain operations. So that is where the national security strategy stands today. Thank you, Namrat. I'm going to ask you another final question because mm -hmm. there are already several Q and A uh, waiting, uh, uh, like queuing up, and I, I want to give words to our audience, which as usually is very, very participant and wants to dialogue with you. So my final question for you is: Where do they stand? Where does Russia and Japan stand in the international space order? I'm particularly interested in Japan because it's kind of like a small country. By seems is doing fantastic stuff. So, uh, what's your uh, what's your position on this? Oh, absolutely. So, when you think about international order uh, as it is constituted today, with the United States being the most oh. advanced space power, and then major countries like China, India, uh, Russia. I would include Russia in that. Russia still has several space capabilities and nuclear. I mean, we didn't even talk about that, right? Uh, Russia has the largest nuclear stockpile, 2,000 tactical nuclear weapons, the highest in the world, and about 1,000 nuclear strategic warheads and 400 delivery vehicles, right? So pretty advanced and 10 nuclear submarines. R uh, Japan doesn't have that uh, capability because it depends on the U.S. nuclear strategic umbrella. So uh, where they stand in terms of the international order, Japan while it has very advanced space capabilities, including, as I mentioned, launch, navigation, now with Counter-Strike, Japan still views itself as an important key partner of the United States. So they view themselves as uh, collaborating with the United States, both in civilian as well as national security space architecture. So civilian would include Artemis program. Japan is the first country to sign the Artemis Accord. And Japan has pretty advanced uh, lunar capabilities. So they have collaborated with uh, the US on that. And when it comes to strategic operational mapping, space situational awareness, 
they tend to follow the United States. Despite the fact they want independent tactical capability, the strategic thinking converges with the US because they are a treaty ally with the United States. So US is obligated to come to Japan's defense, whereas it's not really treaty obligated to come to Taiwan's defense. It's very clear. Now, in terms of Russia, where does it stand? So Russia, as you know, has a very uh, deep strategic pride of who it is. So uh, it is uh, historically the greater Russia concept uh, with the fall of uh, Russia under the czars, uh, the Soviet Union was constituted, again, a major power in the system. Russia sees itself as playing a very critical role in the Second World War, where it was actually collaborating with the Allied forces, right? And so that particular strategic history, the sense of Russian identity is very strong. And I think Russia views itself as losing in terms of the great power game. And that's a big strategic trauma for Russia. And so the fact that they could not uh, dominate their neighborhood, whereas a country like Ukraine uh, was getting closer and closer to the, uh, to the Western world, especially NATO, has challenged a sense of Russia's uh, place where it is. So today, Russia wants to reestablish itself as a major power. And as you so see, the Ukraine conflict probably has challenged some of his thinking as well, because the Russian idea was that they would... Uh, uh, carry out this military operation in Ukraine and would dominate Ukraine in terms of military capability. But the, but the conflict tells you that that's not the case. The Ukrainian military is fighting back with support from NATO and the United States, and Russia is not having it easy, right? So where it stands today is that if you think about international and space order, Russia is viewing its partnership with China as important. So you can see this from President Putin's visit to China just before the Ukraine invasion. So he cared, the only country he cared about in terms of supporting the Russian invasion and military operation was China. Because he knew that in the long term, if the West sanctions or helps Ukraine, the country's implicit support and China put out a lifeline in terms of economy for its oil, buying most of its oil. So, uh, so the, it views itself as a strategic partner with China in that context. And then of course it has gone ahead and signed before the invasion, several agreements with China in terms of space. So in my context, it is appearing that it's a junior partner to China in terms of the space resources and the international order. Having said that, Russia still has enormous nuclear and military and space capability and a strategic culture that views itself as a great power, so it might re-emerge. Uh, the Ukraine conflict will challenge that, but they will still have the desire to re-emerge. I wonder if they had to swallow the pride in becoming junior partners with China. <laughs> I think it's a tactical move. So I say they're a junior partner. They might not say they're a junior partner, right? So it's my language. So when I, when I see their capability and the way they're collaborating with China, uh, I feel they are uh, a more junior partner because of China's capability. Now, in Putin's mind, he might be an equal partner, right? Mm -hmm. So, and you see that in the language of the military doctrine as well. He sees it himself and Russia as an equal partner with the West, not a junior partner. So, yeah. Very interesting. Okay, Namrata, I hear that your fans, they want to talk to you, so I'm going to yeah. shut up and uh, just moderate the questions. I'm going to start with Christophe, who has a double question regarding NATO, which has been named before, so I'm not surprised. Mm -hmm. uh, first, is, so it's a twofold question. First part, is the European component of NATO doing enough to deal with Russia offensive space capabilities and what lessons for emerging European space forces? Second part, does it make sense to coordinate NATO space capabilities with Japan for future conflict in the Indo-Pacific? This is a good question. Oh, very good question. So uh, is NATO doing enough in terms of the European theater, right? That was the first question. And then uh, what more can be done? What are the lessons drawn? I think what is interesting is that NATO has declared space an operational domain. And in fact, in my strategic vocabulary, I like that particular uh, language much more than a war fighting domain. 
right? So operational domain is a much more generic concept. It views space as a support structure and as an as a domain that supports missions in on Earth or further missions in space, right? So in that context, the framing and the conceptualization has been good. Uh, is there enough coordination in terms of what's happening in Russia? I think the Russian invasion of Ukraine has sent some lessons to NATO. One is that, first of all, the very fact that as a military alliance, uh, NATO was not able to deter the invasion is a big lesson, right? Which meant that Russia calculated that uh, even with NATO and Ukraine not being a NATO member, still there were absolute clarity that NATO would have to come together to support this particular uh, uh, military aggression very close to its own uh, border, including the countries in East Europe that are members of NATO. Uh, and yet the military invasion uh, wasn't deterred. So that is a big lesson. Why? Why was it? I think in my estimation, Russia did not uh, did not take seriously the NATO capability to come together in terms of uh, you know threatening Russia because of Russia's nuclear capability, right? And the second thing is that for NATO to be much more effective, it has to have a much more stronger strategic stand besides Article Five. Right, because with Ukraine, Article Five does not get activated. So you need to have certain military postures that take into account the kind of situation you're facing with Russia in Ukraine. So that brings me to the second question, which is a very critical question. Right. So uh, what about East Asia? Does NATO needs a strategic convergence with Japan? Now, NATO and the European Union has said several times in the past few years that China's assertive behavior uh, in East Asia and the world is uh, a growing concern for Europe, right? And for the United States. So given that, I think it makes sense to have strategic partnerships and operational, I'll, I'll use the word operational joint space capability with Japan, because the biggest ally of uh, both NATO and the United States is Japan in East Asia, right? And Japan has pretty advanced spacefaring capability. So it makes absolute strategic sense to have that kind of signaling. Now, it has to be a written joint commitment uh, within that strategic partnership because that's a big signal. Some would say that this would mean there could be escalation uh, on the Chinese side. They would see that as a threat and uh, countervailing or a containment strategy, right? But I think it also signals much more to China that there is deeper commitment to come to the uh, aid or the uh, support of East Asian uh, partners like Japan in case there is escalation of conflict in the East Asian context. So uh, that could deter China from uh, engaging a similar kind of uh, military operation that the Russia has done. So. Thank you, Namrata. Uh, definitely, the, the, the discussion with NATO is, is complex and uh, yes. quite broad. Uh, Michael Maloney is asking, uh, to what extent do you feel that Japan's changes in its space policy represent a loss of confidence in the US protection versus perhaps coming more of, becoming more of a participant in its defense? Good question. Oh, great question again. So, uh, I mean, Japan, I think, uh, has one key strategic concern in terms of US commitment to uh, securing Japan in case there is an escalation in conflict, especially this particular strategic concern got heightened under the Trump administration, right? So under the Trump administration, Trump questioned the fact that the US was paying a rent to Japan uh, in terms of maintaining bases, uh, threatened that they would uh, not deploy the, the, the theater missile defense capability because Japan was not paying up, it has to pay up. So Japan then uh, realized that while there is the treaty commitment, uh, complete dependence of the United States for military support, uh, for technical support, including uh, space support, uh, could be challenged in terms of conflict in case that support goes away 
or in case a United States administration does not have the same level of strategic commitment despite a treaty obligation, right? So to answer your question in short, there is a growing strategic thinking in Japan that while they want to remain a very reliable partner and treaty ally with the United States, you are a better treaty ally if you have your own independent capability, which gives you much more bargaining power as well as negotiating posture, not just with the United States, but also with countries that Japan is trying to foster. So one way that Japan is trying to establish a much more broader strategic partnership beyond the US is the quadrilateral security dialogue, right? So this is a dialogue that Shinzo Abe thought about and it was uh, announced as part of his speech uh, in India and elsewhere. And so the member nations of that particular strategic dialogue is the United States, Japan, Australia, and India. And space and space situational awareness capability is included in the Quad. So you can see that Japan is building up its own independent and multilateral uh, partnerships and capability because of these concerns that in, in case they lose uh, access to US space capability and support, they still have their own capability. So yeah, it is drawn by concern, but it's also drawn by a larger uh, desire to have partnerships with other nations as well. So both is um, not one uh, point strategy. Yeah, not which makes sense. Um, Mark Mayer is asking, uh, in these wartime times uh, in which there is conflict brewing, nations are looking at each other suspiciously, do you think that we can still cooperate, especially when we are cooperating in space technologies and missions that are somehow dual use? I, I think this is kind of extendable to any type of mission because some, somehow as any space technology can be dual use. If it's not a military use, it's going to be a commercial use. So there is always a kind of double edge in space. What do you think? Yeah, I think cooperation is always possible and desired because space capability, and I'll give you an example, right, where cooperation would benefit uh, the world. We, we keep using the word uh, space for humanity, right? But space is also so much driven by national security, and your cafe is perfect place to discuss this, that while we say a lot of rhetoric, in real, uh, in real world policy analysis, space programs are very nationalistic, right? Including the United States space program. Absolutely, it's very, yeah. very nationalistic. So given that framing, uh, a technology where countries can actually jointly collaborate is space-based solar power, right? So space-based solar power is a technology that is possible in terms of physics, but you still need investment from different countries because it's expensive, especially when you do it from Earth. It's a technology that is uh, that promises to address climate change and renewable uh, energy generation. The European Space Agency just announced two projects that they are they are going to invest in. Uh, United Kingdom has announced a program. China has a space solar power program. Japan, India is starting to show interest. Uh, former Indian President Abdul Kalam pushed for it. The U.S. also has two limited uh, program with AFRL, Air Force Research Laboratory and Naval Research Laboratory, and several commercial entities. So that's a particular technology that global collaboration actually can help. And we can talk about the dual use nature, for example, a large satellite like that, but the civilian component of it is so high, right? 24-hour access to solar energy. Now, uh, there are also collaborations happening based on alignment. So Artemis program, for example, the lunar program has generated 26 member nations uh, participating, including Rwanda and Nigeria that signed on. You have countries from Latin America, Europe, uh, Asia, Singapore has just signed the Artemis Accord, UAE. Uh, Saudi Arabia. So you do have space collaboration when it comes to lunar uh, capability, as well as uh, communications. India, US just signed a high level space cooperation agreement to develop uh, space, uh, including lunar and, and space situational awareness capability. So cooperation is possible, but I would say that it will depend country specific because of export control that the US has and the international uh, traffic and arms regulation uh, restrictions, right? So you have to get waiver in a case-by-case -case basis. Space cooperation with China has been very difficult for the United States, Japan, because of China's posture. 
as well as uh, China's inability to demonstrate that its civilian and military space program are separate. So that's a big concern for major spacefaring nations, including India. And so uh, their cooperation is, is not uh, uh, forwarded because of that. Yes, let's say that collaboration is advisable if uh, the benefits of collaboration outnumber the benefit of nationalism and like yeah. uh, Last question from our uh, own uh, editor, Rika. Thank you for being here, Rika. This is very nice. Um, Rika asking, uh, can you elaborate on the fact of a national space policy that is heavily focused on military and defense technology in legacy space countries, legacy space ship was in with commas, yes. on emerging nations in the uh, Asian uh, Southeast uh, Pacific region that are looking to invest heavily on commercial application and they're not so clear or decided on the space defense plan. Yeah, so if you look at legacy nations, uh, let's see who are the legacy nations, right? The United States, China, Russia, Russia, India too. India established its space program in 1969, right? So, uh, and India launched, like other countries in the 1970s, uh, to space. So, uh, if you look at the United States space program, and if you look at the national security strategies of the United States, including their national space policy, while they might have a focus on space diplomacy and space cooperation, Space has always formed a very critical uh, component of dual use capability of all these countries, right? India just recently also established a, a defense space agency, which is India Space Force, and is now calling to establish a military command space structure, right? Operational command. So the legacy countries, the Soviet Union, uh, the United States basically also utilize uh, intercontinental ballistic missile capability to launch to space, right? Sputnik was launched on an ICBM. So the, there, there is a deep uh, connection with the development of national security. Space was viewed as intelligence. So the very fact that Eisenhower did not demand that the uh, space over the United States is sovereign territory is because not because he thought space is this great global common, but because he was worried that if you have such a stipulation, then US spy satellites cannot fly over the Soviet Union, right? So there was that national security component historically. So fast forward to how does that impact emerging countries as they develop their commercial capability? By emerging think, uh, sorry if I'm interrupting, I think uh, so I give you a bit of context. Rika just came back from uh, Lima 23, Malaysia. So I think that's where her question is also coming from, from that kind of perspective. Sorry for interrupting. No, no, I get it. So if you look at emerging countries, say Malaysia, right? Malaysia is taking decisions to invest in space program. Indonesia has taken decisions. Indonesia is an old country with a space program, but it's suddenly deciding that we need to invest in commercial capability. So if you look at emerging countries, uh, United Arab Emirates, uh, you can look at Nigeria from Africa, that is an emerging space nation, uh, Brazil, uh, Argentina, you can see that the commercial investment in space is not just about civilian space programs either. Almost all these countries are also thinking about how they can use their space programs to advance national security and how space can help in terms of their own independent existence as a state. This includes Malaysia as well. Malaysia has problems. Uh, including uh, the problem of radicalization. So utilizing space to map and to have intelligence where areas that they cannot monitor, say with humans can be utilized. Indonesia has ISIS program problem, for example, as, as well as a conflict in its area with the South China Sea Islands. So space is both for civilian commercial as well as national security purpose. And you see that in their space policies as well. So uh, very clear in terms of their focus. 
Thank you, Namrata. Okay, I'm going to close it down here because we're already five minutes afterwards. Uh, thank you, everyone, for the fantastic questions. I have to say this is one of my favorite appointments because it's always so insightful to be able to discuss with you. The audience loves it, and I found it like always incredible. You are like an open book. <laughs> so discussing with you is particularly enriching, Namrata. Uh, thank you very much for being here for the fourth episode. And uh, I would say... Thank you for everyone for staying with us. Thank you, obviously, uh, to Torsten for being our director, to the entire Space Cafe team, Space Watch Global, to our audience. And I will see you probably after the summer for the fifth episode. We have every other free to go, I think. Uh, to, and we will discuss the, the Arabic uh, sector, the Middle East, uh, and Europe. So we still have in some, uh, some focus to go. Shall I take over? Of course. Cool. A great episode. Um, it's always a delight and our audience loves that. Uh, we, we even got a very positive feedback on LinkedIn. So Ram Jaku uh, sent his best regards and said, fantastic uh, conversation. So you guys have fans out our side. So, but before we are coming to the next episode of your programs, we have I think a few dozen of other programs in between. And that starts tomorrow, uh, 9.30 for the early birds uh, in Europe um, and for the very early birds in the US on the East Coast. Uh, we have our, our next Space Cafe Black, um, break, oh, so many Space Cafes, Space Cafe Law Breakfast with Stephen Freeland and we will be joined by our guests, um, Rubimbo uh, Samangar, and Dr. Antonino uh, Salmeri, um, and we will discuss uh, with them the crucial crucial challenge of uh, preserving space sustainability from the next generation's point of view. So on Friday this week, um, we have our next Space Cafe Canada, so at noontime Eastern, um, so 6 p.m. here in Europe, and our wonderful Dr. Jessica West will talk with James Sleepers, the co-founder and CEO of Skywatch. And then next week, Emma and I will be in London. Yeah, uh, at the FT Invest in Space event. And if you're around, say hi. If you want to attend, we have a special discount for you. If you, if you want, um, just a uh, direct message us. And then we also will be at space comms um so next week we don't we don't have space cafes but you can mark your calendar already for the week after so it's on the 13th we will have a 33 minutes um we try to get a studio here in berlin because this these live events really are uh, fun are uh, over uh, over zoom um and then on the 16th we have next space coffee austria um with sabine Pongruber, and on the 22nd our Space Cafe Brazil by Ian Grosner. So uh, find and subscribe our events on Eventbrite. Um, most of them are there already. And as always, we um, like to hear your feedback on Twitter, on LinkedIn, on Facebook, for those few that still use Facebook or, or send us a pigeon or write us a letter or whatever. You will find your ways to communicate with us. Don't forget to sign up to our bi-weekly and daily newsletters. And if you want to support events like that, get yourself um, or very, something very special and become a space watcher that helps us uh, or help us also in the supporter program. Thanks for, um, for your interest today, the audience. And thank you, Namrata and Emma S as usual for this very inspiring um, talk and yeah, to the entire team that made us possible. And that's it. Uh, yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me. And Emma, always wonderfully moderated. It's my pleasure, Namrata. It's my pleasure. You have a fantastic day. Yeah. And uh, we will get in, in touch for the next episode. that's going to be after the summer, beginning of September, I think. Yeah. But sure. We but, might uh, do it then from Paris, obviously. <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah absolutely. wherever wherever so um good and that's it from from us to, for today and one thing is missing don't forget to become a space, a space watcher, watcher.